Hey, what's going on everybody? It's Marcus from TCG Discussions coming at you with a OPO5 tier list video. I have unfortunately got interrupted several times in making this video, so hopefully we can get through this. Um, I have spent a lot of time investing into making this video, uh, preparing the reasons that I have, the leaders that I do uh, for the tiers that they're in. Um, so hopefully you enjoy my reasoning as we take this long journey together. It's going to be a while and, um, hopefully we can get through it together. Um, I'm really excited for OPO5 because I believe it changes a lot of things. Um, and I think my tier list is going to be kind of a, a little bit different than everybody else's. So we'll see, uh, where people stand. Uh, the tier lists are, um, don't play tier three, two, um, 1.5, one that's in 1.25, and then um, tier one. Tier one is the top. There's no S tier, tier zero nonsense. Um, I don't know what anybody's um, talking about with that nonsense. I just, there's no way Sakazuki is tier zero in this meta. But um, we'll get to that eventually and uh, enjoy this journey with me. Uh, we're going to kind of blow through, uh, don't play tier three. And um, just, we'll briefly cover every single one. Shouldn't take too long. So King, bad because his effect does not um, complement what Purple does, which is Dawn Minus. Uh, Sanji, bad color combination. Arlong, bad combina color combination. And Green doesn't have enough good support. Um, Garp is a bad color combination because Black and Red have two different types of removal and his effect doesn't complement. Um, Odin is just a terrible leader outright. Ivankov, her effect is ineffective. It would be better if it was on both players' turn, but even then, it's still not very good. Um, VV can attack, has an underwhelming archetype. Same thing for Shanks. Uh, he can attack, but has an underwhelming archetype. Red Uda, underwhelming archetype. Uh, Black Sakazuki, completely outclassed by Blue Black Sakazuki. Um, and his cost plus the pitch is just absolutely terrible for the kind of removal that Blue Black can do. Um, uh, probably the only black leader in the game that didn't get better by this set because his effect is like just absolutely unplayable. Uh, Red, green, Luffy um, can make some waves, especially with Rush um, and being able to restand. I can see how that could be very effective, but at the same time, in token, it's kind of a, it's kind of a it's kind of a worse law. So we're just gonna leave him down here and don't play for now um, until proven otherwise. Iceberg terrible, can't attack. Effect is underwhelming. Uh, Yamato, uh, Yamato suffers from having her effect only active at two or less life. Coupled with her not having Big Mom tag means she can't play 10 cost Big Mom, nothing else to say. Blue Yellow Croc is a yellow, uh, yellow archive that doesn't have access to Big Mom, but Purple, the effect, it, it's not very good. His life regeneration isn't something that he can stack, and furthermore, he doesn't have the ability to um, basically manipulate those triggers, much like Queen does. So, or Kata Curry does. So it, he just kind of falls behind. He's kind of stuck in this medium trying to do two things at the same time. And he doesn't do either of them well than either the mono colors do or other combinations do with the effects of other leaders. Uh, Rosinante is tier three because the color combination is bad. Coupled with him being a blocker leader is not as effective as everybody thinks. They should have made him a five life leader and made the Dawn effect for him to stand and uh, to be a blocker again and have one 1k more power he would have been far more effective as a leader um i think if they had done that uh rob lucci the cost of his um uh effect is just too much uh pitching two cards out of hand in mono black is just not not a good day uh zef zef is one of those leaders that um the cost his don minus cost is naturally conflicting with the complementary color of purple Purple Dawn Minus is a lot. The best effective cards to Dawn Minus are um, high cost cards at Dawn Minus a lot. Ergo, he, if he does that on top of it, he's just losing the game at that point. Um, also, his cost being minus four Dawn. I like the range that it hits, three or less, but minus four is just, it's just too costly with what Purple is trying to do. So um, he also doesn't have any ramp to like help him back up, and that's kind of problematic. Um, so for that reason, he's down here tier three, uh, Kuro is just lacking good top end green support or mid game tier support. Um, and green just needs like an eight cost card that just pops two cards, um, with a higher cost than four. 
Um, Red Luffy, Red Luffy could be higher because he's red, which means he has access to Rush, which means he plays well to Sakazuki, he has good searchers. Um, but unlike Whitebeard, he can't take his own life, he can get stalled out, and if he breaks, he breaks, and like there's just no coming back from a bad break game with Red Luffy. Um, which you could say that about any deck, but it's with him it's a little bit different because he needs to see the pressure cards in order to even have a remotely good game plan, which kind of stinks. Um, next is Ishio, bad color combination. I like Ishio's effect, but green just doesn't have better tools. Once it gets better tools, no PO6, it'll be better. Uh, blue, purple, croc, um, same thing as the, the, uh, the, uh, yellow, purple croc. Um, color combination's a little bit weird. What he's trying to do, it just doesn't effectively work out. Uh, Nami, Nami is garbage in this meta. Uh, she is absolutely dogged here. Um, Literally lower than the Taco Bell meat uh, quality at your local Taco Bell. She's so bad. Um, why Zeph is never going to work against Sakazuki. Um, all of her cards are going to get bottom decked. Against Purple, Magellan's going to just feast her alive. Um, setting her deck back on it all is just means that she can't invest into plays that would be uh, good for her. Um, she's gonna get even potentially worse because there's hand checks in the game. We kind of have one right now. Um, so bottom line is, is she, does, she doesn't have an effective game plan. She also dies to Rush, which Rush is really good because of Sakazuki. Ergo, she's going to be even worse than that. Moving on to Tier 2, uh, we have Zoro here. Zoro, unlike Red Game Law, cannot bounce and searches back to hand to reuse them again. This means that Zoro runs into quite a big issue, both with Whitebeard and Sakazuki. Whitebeard and Red Purple Luffy being 6k leaders naturally means that his weenies need more Dawn to actually even apply pressure, which is naturally good, of which they got better cards to defend themselves thanks to the list being off, uh, rescinded for all the red cards that it was. Red Purple Luffy, for example, having access to 9 Beard just makes Zoro's entire day awful, and simultaneously... With the introduction of Rob Lucci, every black deck in the game has now an immediate red uh, check to Zoro's game plan. So for that reason, um, he is now down at tier two for me. I could see an argument because of Rush that he could be higher than that. Smoker. Smoker is the only uh, leader on this tier list. I think everyone else has been smoking when they say that he's trash or tier three or worse. Um, Smoker, because he is a mono black leader, with what he just got in Hina Rebecca alone, he's going to have value. Um, Rebecca, Rob Lucci, and Manchuri are insane boons for Smoker. And again, I just, I don't see any world where he, it was worse because of what happened in OPO5. He, if not, got better. Um, Magellan, Magellan's super strong leader. He's just worse than Purple Luffy, so that's why he's down here at Tier 2. Um, his, it, it, Purple Luffy's just better. Um, Kid, um, uh, Kid, uh, gets way worse because of Sakazuki. Not much to talk about with this. Kianmon is higher on my tier list at Tier 2 than everyone else's. He cheats cards in, has good rest effects in his archetype has good searchers, and his effect to cheat a card in is always just naturally going to be better, period. Enough, enough said. There's nothing else to talk about. Bella Betty's tier two. She's a glass cannon, but she hits hard, so she can sneak out some wins and edge it out if played well. Uh, Blue Dofi can spam the board. It's going to be really effective against White Bear or Purple Luffy. Um, yeah, on that, not much to say. Um, uh, Purple Kaido. Um, uh, Purple Kaido basically uh, is a really strong leader. I like his effect. The problem is, is that his ramp isn't active and he doesn't have a one cost searcher. If he had a one cost searcher, I think Kaido could be uh, tier 1.5, tier 1. Um, blue purple Kaido runs into the problem of purple not having any good removal that pops. Um, if purple hat or blue had better KO effects, it would be it, he could be really strong. The thing is with Brew Purple Kaido is not only do you have to attach Dawn and you have to KO a card, which is doable, especially if they have blockers or you have something to hard remove it. Blue as an archetype either bounces or bottom decks. So half of his color card pool is naturally against what his leader wants. Uh, Yellow Lin Lin is just naturally better than Yamato because she has access to Big Mom, enough said. Um, and she's definitely tier two because she has access to all the yellow cards 
and Big Mom, period. That Enough said. Um, Sabo, Sabo is really, really close. Uh, but the problem with Sabo is, is the red, red, black archetype combination. Uh, this is kind of problematic uh, in, in a sense that, again, they don't have a removal that complement each other well. But Sabo's effect is broken. So he's really close. He just needs a little bit more support. Hopefully we can get something solved for him. And then Blue Crocodile, um, yeah, is really good. Um, he's probably the best of the blue leaders, but we're going to have him down in here at tier two. Uh, moving on to tier 1.5, we're going to get into a lot more discussion here. Um, to uh, start off from the bottom of the top, we've got Black Yellow Lumen. Black Yellow Lumen is actually really, really good. Um, with uh, You're going to be like, how? Well, Thunderbird, Godatsu, the Billion Volts, and... Um, oh, man. Uh, Rob Lucci and Rebecca with Hina automatically make her insane. Um, so let me talk about Sakazuki for a second. Sakazuki's discard pitch effect is essentially saying, um, I got rid of a brick that I'm going, like a Hina, in my hand in order to regenerate it later with Rebecca. What Lin Lin does is says, I'm going to regen a life, oh, and draw a card, because Sakazuki draws a card. I'm going to regen a life while swinging seven at something to set up the same thing that you just set up. But the issue is with Black Yellow Linlin that the issue with Black Yellow Linlin is that she essentially gets to draw that card later by forcing you to swing into her and make it a little bit worse. So this is a really, really strong effect coupled with Gadatsu and the, um, the Thunderbird extra card with the minus effects that occur from black with Kuzan and um, Hina, you can get a lot of value out of it. Uh, Yusis Kid, red purple, um, is actually really strong. He's a five life dual color leader, which is nothing to sleep on because that minus effect basically means he gets an extra card. Um, that coupled with a five drop kid, his leader effect can start to swing for some pretty big numbers. He also gets a lot of effective um, pressure out of playing all the cards that he normally wants to play. Um, he can go a little bit Dawn minus, so, um, and that can start to affect his curve on certain top end cards. But other than that, he's gonna be a force. I would not be surprised if he actually steals a couple of tops. Uh, Black Luffy, there's nothing more to say than other than getting Rebecca, Rob Lucci, and Mancherry. This leader is nuts. Um, he basically gets, Rob Lucci can, directly translate to a 7k leader swing while putting a four for six body on the board um i i just i don't know what else to tell you on that like he's really good um queen queen is queen is here in 1.5 but he could be higher um so he has an insane matchup in asaka uh, it literally at a one double life, like if Yamato and his effect resolves healing, he, he like Sokka could lose the game right there. Um, he has removal for all of your blockers that can't be KO'd. So you're not really going to be protected. When you play Hina, you give him an active target to attack to into for regen. And uh, Sokka's main problem is breaking with a bunch of events and those nine cost cards consecutively being played are gonna generate a lot of problems. Number one, you're gonna to have to spend start spending a lot more cards than you normally would to get rid of the higher cost cards. Number two, you have an issue with the hand advantage of once those nine cost cards aren't getting removed anymore, you're going to have to start, the tax is going to be really high because he doesn't have a lot of counter power. And him being able to regenerate life basically can put entire good turns. Like it's a good turn when Sokka swings for one damage while removing two of your cards. Well, if he just regens that one life or regens two of those lives, while then also getting rid of your cards, it can be pretty good. Um, so that, and he plays well in grinding into Katakuri and an L, really strong. Purple Luffy, a little bit iffy, and Whitebeard can be a little bit iffy too. But he can handle Whitebeard if he can keep the number of attacks focused to one. So we'll see. Uh, Ace, Ace is insane. 
He doesn't break with events. He's got access to Red Rush, which is good against Sokka. And to uh, top it off, he's got just really powerful event cards that just are insane. Um, Grape Dofi. Uh, Grape Dofi got a lot of support in this set. I'm actually pretty excited. They got a Searcher, which is Don Flamingo art type. They got some insane event cards. Um, I look forward to seeing what they can do, uh, splashing some of those in with the film package and seeing like what people come up with. Um, where we go from here is just where we really start separating the boys from the men, okay? Um, Red Purple Law. Red Purple Law is an insane deck coming into OPO5. You got Gamma Knife. You have the Searcher event card, you have Researcher Law, and you have the new Beppo. The two Searcher cards mitigate two of Law's problems, which is hand advantage and seeing his ramp cards. So they mitigate that. That coupled with Queen and the Khalifa, you can get a little bit more, um, you can get a little bit more um, value translated. His Dawn Minus with the new kid is insane. Um, so there's just a whole lot of removal while generating a lot of cards on the board and going wide, which means his removal, uh, the removal of Sakazuki is actually really, really strong, uh, while he's counter removing cards that normally can't even be KO'd. Um, round table is still one of the most broken cards in the game. It's one of the best cards to answer 10 cost big mom and eight other high, high cost cards. So there's nothing to say. Red purple law is going to be a menace. Rebecca. Rebecca has one of the best matchup spreads across the board. There's a graph to prove it. I have no idea why anybody in their right mind thinks this leader is bad. Every single card that is good in Sakazuki, Rebecca got. What are you talking about? There's just a lot of things going on that are really, really good for it, okay? So this nonsense about, you know, like Rebecca just being not playable because Sakazuki's here is stupid. Um, Kiros can't die, basically at all. All your cards that you play with Sakazuki can easily get attacked over or attacked at immediately with everything they play. Furthermore, Luffy can just outright annihilate a board while making you spend cards from your hand to protect cards on the board that you've spent a lot of investment into. And furthermore, above all of that, it has access to the same cards that you play that are broken. It has access to Rob Lucci. It has access to Rebecca. It has access to Mancherry. It has access to Hound's Blaze. So the moment you think that all of Rebecca's tools are just somehow like gone to the wind because Sokka's here is just absurd. And her matchup spread is insane. The only thing that she actually loses outright to is like Bello Betty and High Level Rush. That's it. On that, there's not much to say. Then there's Red Green Law. Red Green Law, the only matchup in the entire game that is preventing this from being a tier one leader is Sakazuki. Um, Sakazuki unfortunately puts Law in a horrible position, which means he cannot play his cards early because he can't protect them by bouncing them to the hand, or they're just gonna he's just gonna auto lose them for value. They're gonna generate the board so get their attacks off anyway, so it doesn't matter. Um, however, there is a point where if he can have enough Dawn to play multiple cards at the board, fill up the board, and then start bouncing and then like replaying his cards and then have enough to like defend himself on like clapback then forcing Sakazuki to remove the whole board that is when Law is going to win because he can have these extra pluses that he just regenerated off of the bounce back with Law and the play to the initial play to all the cards on the board that will be continuously replaced every turn now forcing your opponent to get rid of the board over and over again. You go too wide, and they eventually fold. Um, next, the the top of the 1.5 and nearly tier 1 leader, like 1.25-ish probably, is Red Purple Luffy. Red Purple Luffy is, like, insane, okay? Um, he's He could be a 9K leader with Yusuke's Kid and Nine Beard. Nine Beard came back. He got back Nami. He got back, they got, he got back everything. He has four Radical Beams. So he's basically Whitebeard, except for he can ramp, right? He gets to ramp at zero, and he gets to ramp at eight, nine, and ten. The reason this is important, even on going first curve at seven dawn, he can play kid, ramp, go to seven, swing for seven, do whatever he's going to do, and then next he goes to eight, ramps to nine, plays nine beard, goes to eight, swings with kid again. Now he's a 9K leader. He's guaranteed to get to ten. And then that is 
seven, nine, I'm sorry, seven, ten, seven, ten. Yeah, so it would be seven, oh, sorry, eight, ten, seven, and the ten drop Luffy, all played in the same turn. Because he can do that. He can, because even when Kid Dawn minuses, he can then ramp that Dawn to go to 10 to take a whole nother turn and then swing for um, basically, basically 14 and 7. 14, I'm sorry, 14 and 1. Uh, so 1 would be, no, 0 actually. So it'd be 14 and 6. Um, now that plays a little bit worse because you had to dawn minus before, so you didn't get the immediate ramp and then the re-ramp from the 10 drop in order to increase your dawn to basically five on your next turn. You're halfway there, but this is where it also gets really stupid. He's a straw hat pirate that can play the Jambe. Just ignore all the blockers of Sakazuki. They think they're protected and then swing for 15. Like that coupled with. The red, purple Luffy can be broken. I mean, that's still 50. It could still be 15 coming at you unblockable. So red, purple Luffy, make no mistake, got a lot of strong tools. And like a lot of good ones at that. Especially if he establishes kid, five drop kid, seven drop kid, nine beard into the 10 drop. And all that somehow still lived. If he gets a seven cost kid, play Don Minus and then re-ramp on the turn that he uh, goes to play the 10 drop and he doesn't have to use the effect, the game's over. Yeah, you'll just effectively lose. Uh, moving on to tier one. Tier one is head and shoulders above every single leader in the game, except for the exception of Red, Red Purple Luffy, okay? Even the tier 1.5s that have good matchups into them, they still have their struggle points for various reasons. So Sakazuki still bottom decks, which means Kiros can still get, you can still get rid of Kiros. Um, you can easily get rid of the seven drop Luffy, even if he's attacking over your cards. Um, and so it's not like he gains rush. So that's why like it can be bad, right? Um, but that's why like Sakazuki is just going to be that head and shoulders above basically everything. But it's not like these other tier 1.5 leaders can't contest the tier one. It's just that they have probably some bad matchups of the leaders in the tier one and they're, um, or they themselves have some kind of issue against one matchup in particular that's going to be really popular that duck them down. But none of these leaders in tier one have any of the other issues. In fact, the only, like, they're, they are so close that it is just outright annoying to figure out what's going on, okay? So in the, the, the gatekeeper of tier one is an L. So an L... Um, is like the cockroach that is queen, but you can map it without knowing what's going to happen because it can either swing the game immediately or make things really bad. So Anel has the ability to regen a life after he's lost a life and you have to pitch a card. So you take a life, when your last life goes out, you can stack the top deck of your life and then pitch a card, okay? Oh, this effect is super annoying in tandem with Yamato because basically he'll go to two, making it one, two, get a life, three, and then you have to swing for lethal. That demands four attacks to go lethal with that play every single time. And if they're doing that while removing your cards, it's just not a good day. The other issue with the null is that he has access to Elthor. He has access to all the good yellow triggers and blockers, which means if a Brule or Sanji, the math just gets worse, especially with Capone. So I, I, there's not enough to say. Anel is an insane leader, right? He literally gatekeeps the entire meta below him. I'm like not even trolling with that comment. Like, he's easy to play. He's got cards that can spam. His board can go extremely wide. He's got extremely powerful cards. He's got life regen on top of life regen. He's got like Nakamura Arrow, all these other things. Like he's an absurd leader. So this, he's, he's nuts. Um, and then Purple Luffy, uh, moving on, Purple Luffy is just the best Purple Leader in the game. Um, Red Purple Luffy can contest him a little bit, but he gets to choose when he ramps. And those ramps directly turn into pluses, which is another reason why Nami is terrible. 
uh, because Dami can't stall his life out. He just outright gets to ramp into cards that break her over and over again. So, again, uh, he's playing the best form cards of the game. He gets to re-ramp with a 5-drop. He gets the best ac access to the best of purple. He gets access to 10-drop Luffy, which in certain situations is just... It's, it's curtains. It can literally just be curtains. The fact that he gets to ramp active Dawn so low at any point in the game is just absurd. So, um, next, uh, moving on, Kana Curry. Um, these next three are the top three of the top tier, okay? But speaking to Katakuri for a second, Katakuri may be the best deck in the game. It may be. It could be Whitebeard, it could be Sakazuki. What's for sure, the, this is proven statistically, right? There's graphs out there to show it. Katakuri is a 6-4 matchup in Sakazuki, okay? And there's lots of good reasons for it. All the yellow triggers he currently has, plus all the yellow triggers that we're getting, on top of all the other future yellow triggers, paint that Katakuri is just going to body Sakazuki. Okay? He gets access to 10-drop Big Mom. If you pay attention to how you need to play the matchup, you just win. You see two 10-drop Big Moms in a game. If that resolves, he's lost. And you can stall yourself to get there. You have five life, you have lots of triggers, you have blockers, you have what up. You know, they're spending their cards to get rid of it. You just attack their board. Just live. Just live. You're going to regenerate. It's going to be fine. It's all good. There's no situation besides Katakuri bricking and not seeing Big Mom that you should just not win eventually. It just becomes too much. Removing one 10 cost card is a problem. Removing two 10 cost problem is nearly impossible by that point in the game because they've obviously focused on getting rid of other stuff. So if you can maintain getting rid of their board while simultaneously eventually getting to that big mom, them losing two life and having that stuff trash while regening life and getting another attack back that they have to establish while getting rid of other cards on the board, it's curtains, bro. It's curtains. Don't know why we're even discussing whether or not, like, and then not to mention, Connor Curry essentially forces Whitebeard to take all of his life outright. Just forces him to take out it all outright. Because eventually Big Mom's going to sack him and they're going to lose a little bit of advantage out of it. Um, moving on to probably, in my opinion, the second to third best deck in the game is Sakazuki. Um, I don't think he's better than Whitebeard. I'll talk about that here in a second. But Sakazuki is just an animal. Okay? Like, I don't think a better color combination could have been brought forth. It was actually one of the reasons why I was interested in playing Rebecca, but, like, Rebecca can't attack, so that's problematic. And then, furthermore, like, like this combination would have been broken, but then they decided to make Rebecca, which could grab Hina, and Rob Lucci, which could also be got by Rebecca. Rob Lucci pops two cards, Hounds Blaze, turns Brennu into a bottom deck of two or less, and a 6k attack. Or an 8k leader swing. I don't know what the heck they were thinking. I don't I don't know what they were thinking. I'm like, and then his leader effect, on swing minus is something, and then activate main, pitch a card, draw a card, and then Rob Lucci bottom decks three cards, so that's feeding into that. You bottom deck those houseways, you bottom deck, you know, other things. And then you pitch Hina, a, a brick in your hand, and then replay it later off Rebecca. What are we doing? It is just an amalgamation of efficiency. He is insane. He is so good. So good that he takes decks like Zoro and Red Green Law and poses the question on how you ever thought these decks were really that good. Even though those decks are insane. Buffing your entire board by 1k is insane. Returning cards to your hand and playing a 5 cost down for 2 energy that then bounces another card and turns you into more pluses or puts another blocker on the board. Is insane. And Sakazuki makes all of their low cost game completely irrelevant. You can't play low to the ground ever again. As long as this leader is around. In fact, as long as Rob Lucci's around, you probably can't ever play low to the ground ever again. Sakazuki. For all the like downplay it's probably seen that I've had for him in this video, for all of that, I'm telling you. It is the strongest out-the-box leader 
generically that they probably ever made. And the support that they gave him and the color black was nuts. Absolutely nuts. I mean, there are so many ways to build this leader too, right? On top of the efficiency, right? You could build him to go tall, you could build him to go wide. You could build him to effectively answer at the mid to low end, or you could build him to answer the top end. If there's ever a meta where Red Rock is just the default thing to be playing, he has access to it. If there's ever a meta where 3000 Worlds just needs to be that little effective push over, right? Over Hound's Blades, he can play it. Anything that's ever made good for Blue ever again, he can play it. Anything that will ever be good for Black, which is already arguably one of the broken, most broken colors, and it just got in, insanely way better with the release of OBO5. He can play it. Gecko Moria in next set, OBO6. He can play it. That's the, that's the point. He is insane. He has only two weaknesses, and they're pro pretty much himself, right? Low, high cost, lots of events, high amounts of events in hand with low counter, and not seeing the amount of removal at the right time in certain matchups. That mainly comes down to deck building, though. And kind of like how you can help get that, generate that game plan and get it consistently off the ground to keep going. But make no mistake, this leader's nuts. Okay? I'm not, I'm, I know for a fact that this leader will be a top leader in the game at least until OPO6 comes out, because it's looking like they've kind of solved that problem over there. But yeah, I, he is insane. Will he dominate our meta? Absolutely not. Like, I have no belief whatsoever that this is a tier zero leader that will win every tournament like it did in Japan. And let me talk about why that is for a second. Number one, Japan likes a shiny new toy, period. They found something they like, they stuck with it, they didn't test anything else. Number two, Whitebeard and Katakuri both saw success against him, both recently for Whitebeard and OPO6, and um, Katakuri at the tail end of OPO5 winning an event. So let me spell this out for you. North America is nothing but a full of Katakuri and Whitebeard players. The only reason why we weren't playing Whitebeard for the last month is because he was banned. And now he's back. There's nothing else to say, okay? He is probably not going to have nearly the dominance that he did. We will play these effective decks that we have known and come to love because of the fact that we know what they do and we know how to play them. And if it's not broke, don't fix it. There's no reason to try and fix it. So this leads into my final leader, Whitebeard. He's broken, bro. I mean, there's nothing to say. I mean, you get like 12 cards in hand. You have six life to start. You could get nine bear on board, be protected at two life like every other leader at that point in the game. He has access to rush, which is good against Connor Curry. 6K leader, which means that he's hard for all the weenie decks like, like freaking Law and freaking Zoro and everything else that attack at him. He's just making math bad for decks like Sakazuki. On top of that, he gets access to rush card after rush card after rush card after rush card after rush card, which means he's going to be able to pull the pressure. He has access to good removal and the Marco, whatever. He got freaking four rad beams, so that means like all of his Nami search is going to be hitting all these extra cards and events. And he's got to have like 25k counter power in hand. So you can't ever actually kill him even with like a big mom swing full dump 10. There's nothing else to say, dude. He's broken. So, him purple Luffy, bro. They out here rough riding it at the top. They brought him back, though. So, I mean, like, obviously, right? Red, red, red's dead, right? Red's dead, red's dead. Like, you know, OPO5, red's clearly like bad now. Oh, well, yeah, you'll all see. It's not going to be bad. It's not, it's not going to be, it's not going to be bad at all. Red's not dead. Red, red's back and he's fully alive. Like, I mean, that's just how it is, man. So, uh, that pretty much does it for my tier list video. Um, I don't think I missed anything. Uh, thank you so much for watching. And I really appreciate it for sticking in, uh, through it with me on this one. Um, kind of went through things kind of fast. Uh, but I hope my explanations kind of make sense. Um, if I can find the website that has the chart, the chart that I would, that was shared to me, 
uh, basically shows all these matchups, and it, it'll just prove you that, like, Sakazuki is just not going to be some great tier broken zero god. So, um, enjoy. I will see you guys in the next one. And this is Marcus from TCG Discussions signing off, and I will catch you later.